Hello and welcome back. I'm Tim Willoughby here with, uh, with Ian Duke, ready for <laughs> round five here at Pro Tour at the Gatewatch. Last round we were talking about how the Eldrazi were kind of lurking in the background, hadn't quite made it onto our camera. This round they've well and truly invaded the feature match area. Let's head down and find out how. Hello and welcome to round five here of Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. Tim Willoughby here with Ian Duke and we have a feature match area packed with talent and packed with the Eldrazi. We're going down to our first match here between two Japanese Hall of Famers. There we see uh, Shuhai Nakamura. He's playing with Team Channel Fireball and he actually was potentially looking at skipping this Pro Tour. One of the first Pro Tours he hadn't made it to in a long time until he made top eight of a recent GP and now very much back in the seat of things. 3 0 his draft, and he is here with an Eldrazi deck in Duke. Yeah, the, this Channel Fireball Eldrazi deck is super cool. Uh, of course, it's it's got the, the classic Eldrazi mana base of Eye of Ugin and Eldrazi Temple, but the real innovation that uh, Channel, Fireball, Channel Fireball has brought here is the addition of Simeon Spirit Guides and Chalice the Void. Well, he's up against Makihiso Mahara in what is going to be a matchup that's pretty important for this Pro Tour. Mahara on burn, looking to be very aggressive. Let's see how this matchup is going to play out. Well, a turn one Simeon Spirit Guide allows for Chalice the Void on one, and one has to think that that is absolutely brutal against a burn deck. Yeah, it definitely is, Tim. This is the real innovation of the deck. I mean, Chalice the Void, in a format as fast as modern, shutting down your opponent's one drops can shut down as much as, you know, 30%, maybe even 50% of their deck. Yeah, I'm looking through Mahara's list here, and suddenly Goblin Guide, Grim Lava Mancer, Wild Nacatl, Monastery Swift Spear, Lava Spike, Lightning Bolt, uh, all countered upon being cast here. Rift Bolt being suspended by there, there by Mahara, but we can see that he's already got two cards stranded in his hand uh, thanks to that Chalice of the Void. And Ghost Quarter coming down for uh, Shuhai Nakamura here. Yeah, luckily for Mihara, no powerful uh, second turn play for Shuhei Nakamura, just an attack with Blink, Blink Moth Nexus. Blink Moth Nexus, not just a man land, it is one that produces colorless mana and colorless mana very relevant to Eldrazi. Some of the Eldrazi lists are more like mono black lists that happen to have um, Eldrazi on top. This list is actually much more straightforwardly a colorless deck. Yeah, this is a nearly mono colorless, actually. So an endless one there coming down as a 4 4. No attack from the creature land this turn. And Makahito Mahara drawing kind of thin here. As a 4-4, as a it's just big enough that one burn spell not going to be enough to deal with it. Mahara fighting the brave fight by pointing at Taka's command at Nakamura. Yeah, this is a rough spot for Mahara. Not only are all his one drops turned off, that includes most of his creatures. And uh, even if he could resolve a creature, a 4-4 endless one is larger than pretty much all the creatures in the burn deck. And there's Matsuri Shaper just making sure that even if Mahara does get draw steps, he doesn't get too many. Uh, step one, turn off a lot of your spells. Step two, kill you real quick. Even if that Matsuri Shaper dies, a good chance that it's going to get something nice for Shuhei Nakamura here as a replacement. Thought Not Seer goes to the hand for Shuhei Nakamura. No fourth land yet. Um, but of course, he can cast that Thought Not Seer off of Eldrazi Temple next turn. And Mihara is casting a surprising amount of spells considering what we know about the makeup of his deck and how it faces off against Chalice of the Void. But um, Matter Reshaper there revealing that there's not too much going on in Mihara's hand and more big swings from Nakamura looking to close out this first game fairly decisively. As yeah. This has been an impressive showing from the Eldrazi deck. I think the main deck Chalice the Voids are really, really well positioned for this tournament here, Tim. Yeah, I mean, one of the big talks before this tournament was about how 
very, very aggressive decks would be well positioned in the field. And we don't know whether or not Shuhei Nakamura knew anything about what Mehara was going to be playing this tournament. He was quite happy to fire off a chalice for one, just because he knows how good it is in, in the modern format in total. Uh, we'll be able to show you some more magic very shortly, but first, these messages. Play in Pro Tour Gauntlet events starting Wednesday on Magic Online and test drive one of the top decks from this Pro Tour. For more information, go to mtgo.com. In the art of Magic the Gathering Zendikar, you can experience the danger and beauty of Zendikar like never before. This lavishly illustrated hardcover book features the award-winning art of Magic the Gathering and gives you an insider's look at the secrets of Zendikar, its peoples, continents, and creatures. On sale now. Hello and welcome back to round five of Pro Tour Earth of the Gatewatch. We've just seen the Eldrazi deck in the hands of Shuhei Nakamura take down game one against his opponent Makahito Mahara. We're going to get a chance to see some more of that deck, but in a different set of hands. This Luis Scott Vargas, he's picked up one loss so far, but still very much in the fight against his friend Eric Frolik. And again, we see a Charles the Void on one in play. This time, though, there's Reality Smasher smashing right in and giving Eric Frolik, who's managed to get Scott Vargas down to 12, pause for thought. It looks like he's both taken that hit and fetched with his fetch land. So these, these life totals going down pretty, pretty swiftly here. Predictions of a control heavy meta game have thus far not seemed accurate. This is very much an aggressive format now that Splinter Twins removal and the addition of Oath of the Gate Watch has shaken things up a bit. Though I, I suppose that Luis Scott Vargas does have a permanent in play that counters spells. So Restoration Angel from Eric Frolith in return means that he's going to be able to attack Scott Vargas here down to just single digit life total. Luis, normally a very quick player, pausing for thought here. Um, but equally, Eric Frolik, exactly the sort of man who's able to read that sort of play like a book. So attacks here from Blink Moth Nexus and the Reality Smasher. And a big quarter calling. Eric Frolik's deck is one that's able to do some fairly nifty things when it comes to Court of Calling. It's not simply playing it for value. There is a big combo in there. Yeah, this looks like Court of Calling for Eternal Witness here. Yeah, Kiki Jiki already in the graveyard. Not quite sure how many copies of it are in Eric Frolik's deck, but with Kiki Jiki, you can do some very, very naughty things in this deck. Yeah, and sure enough, Kiki Jiki coming back off the Eternal Witness. That is going to threaten a uh, lethal attack this turn. And Evro going for it. Yeah, a dismember, basically the only thing that might save Scott Vargas there. It turns out he does not have it. Eric Froelich picking up the first game there. We can see that uh, Nakamura and Mihara still shuffling up after they've sideboarded. So we're going to get a chance to see a little bit more Eldrazi action. This time, though, a rather different Eldrazi list. This are King of the Hill table, and we have Ryochi Tamada. He is playing black Eldrazi. Now, talk us through the big highlights of this list, at least in terms of game one. Yeah, so one of the major draws to playing black in your Eldrazi deck is it lets you combine Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth with your special Eldrazi lands like Eye of Ugin. And off of that black ma mana, we see Ryuji Tamada is splashing three copies of Pack Rat, actually. Yeah, also a very disruptive uh, discard package, but right here it's dismembers the black spell being cast and not too much pain being taken to do so, clearing the way for a couple of Thought Knot Seers to get stuck in. They're not just discard spells, they are also really pretty effective attackers. And Alex Bianchi, he's playing one of the sort of developments, I guess, following on from the lack of Splinter Twin. This is a Jeskai control deck more akin to what was being played by um, Sean McLaren at the Pro Tour, where he wasn't actually needing all of the Splinter Twin side of things, simply able to play control. In this case, though, falling to the Eldrazi, 
The Eldrazi doing great work in this feature match area. Yeah, absolutely. It's been very impressive so far. In fact, the only feature match not featuring any Eldrazi in this feature match area, the one we've not had a chance to see yet, Darwin Castle on Affinity is playing against John Finkel with Infect. But we're going to get a chance to go back to our main match here. On the left of our screen, that's Shuhai Nakamura. On the right, we have Makahito Mahara, just played a Grim Lava Mansa there. Eldrazi Mimic on turn one from Shuhei Nakamura. In principle, there is a very exciting start for some of the decks involving Eldrazi Mimic, where you just simply play an Ayabugin and then cast, you know, four of them on the first turn. Kind of magical Christmas land, but every now and again, it, somewhere in this room, there's a the potential it may happen. Yeah, it's definitely possible. Eldrazi Mimic, uh, one of the cards that leads to the explosive um, Eldrazi draws. Although notably, not all the Eldrazi decks, in fact, I think most aren't playing Eldrazi Mimic uh, at the tournament here today. So just showcasing a couple different directions you can take the, the Eldrazi deck. As it is, though, Mihara off to a better start here, notably not being hampered by a uh, Chalice of the Void here, able to deploy a whole bunch of one-drops. Grim Lava Mancer in play, along with Monastery Swift Spear. Clearing a path, killing the first Eldrazi Mimic, but there's Spell Skite, which will represent a fairly major speed bump for Makahito Mahara here, unless he can find an appropriate answer pretty quickly. Not just a 0-4 blocker, also able to change targets onto Spell Skite, and with four toughness, most individual burn spells not quite enough to kill it. You can see a Molten Rain in hand for Makahito Mahara here. And being on the play, that's going to be a nice one. Able to take down some of the powerful lands that Shuhei Nakamura is using alongside his Eldrazi. Send him right back to the Stone Age and deal some points of damage on top. And there we see it. Eldrazi Temple going away. Two points of damage on top there from the Molten Rain. Three mana. Land destruction, not necessarily something that R&D pushes through too much these days. Yeah, much less three mana double land destruction against the Eldrazi <laughs> deck. Killing one land is like killing two. Looks like Nakamura, though, able to bounce back. He's got that uh, Blink Moth Nexus there to cast an Eldrazi Mimic. Destructive Revelry there, taking down Spell Skite. When every one of your removal spells also deals damage to your opponent's face, you're in a pretty good spot. There's Eldrazi Mimic, uh, got the sort of Kozilek style face there, and potentially with a big creature here. So this a 3-3 three, three Endless One means that that Mimic able to attack for a little bit more. So Grim La Lava Mancer declining to kill the Eldrazi Mimic in response to its uh, stat copying trigger, instead dealing two damage to Shuhei Nakamura himself. Likely means there's a, a flurry of burn about to be followed up with here from Makihita Mahara. Well, Path to Exile successfully getting rid of the one remaining blocker for Shuhai Nakamura, clearing a path for a couple of hasty attacks, and this time we see Grim Lava Mancer quite happy to sit back and get activated to deal more burn. Previously, it was getting attacks on. Yeah, that will drop Shuhei down to just four points of life with, I uh, believe, an active Grim Lava Mancer. It's hard to get a look at the graveyard here at this angle, but... It's kind of cool that the only basic lands in Shuhei Nakamura's deck are two copies of Wastes. So when someone casts a Path to Exile on him, he is able to fetch a basic land. And that enough to push things to a game three. Makahita Mahara on the play there, able to exploit that to the maximum. We're going to get a chance to jump across to one of our other matches, though. The fourth match that we've not had a chance to see from yet on the left of our screen. Hall of Famer, Darwin Castle against, on the right, uh, Hall of Famer, John Finkel. Five, now, both of these players, about 20 years ago, <laughs> were at the very first Pro Tour. Darwin Castle in the seniors event. He was actually congra uh, congratulating John Finkel earlier on on being young enough that he was playing in the juniors event. <laughs> yep. Yeah, this is a, a feature match that could have been straight out of, you know, 1999 or what have you. So it's, it's really cool to see these Hall of Famers uh, still going at it, still being successful. And a bit of a, a poison mirror there. Uh, 
loads of Ink Moth Nexus poison coming from Darwin Castle, outracing the poison coming from John Finkel's poison. Uh, so that one moving to sideboarding. We have got some more matches to show you, though. We're going to jump back and see a little bit more of Luis Scott Vargas up against Eric Froelich. Remember that on the left of our screen, Vargas is playing with the same sort of uh, Eldrazi deck as Shuhai Nakamura. On the right-hand side, that being Eric Froelich. And this time round, Scott Vargas's draw, plenty of creatures in play. Will there be a combo from Froelich, though, to dismantle this? It looks like that might be Kiki Jiki already exiled thanks to one of two Thought Knots here. And that could be a big deal in terms of Eric Froelich's combo potential here. Wow, super aggressive draw from Luis here. Eldrazi Mimic copying Reality Smasher. Yeah. Just crashing in for a ton of damage here. Yeah, it does not copy the Trample, but it's still a 5-5 body, which is substantially larger than the standard 2-1. Eye of Ugin doing some great work here. This is not necessarily a deck that can search out a big finish with its Eye of Ugin. It's not necessarily going to find you a Kozilek or anything similar. Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, perhaps. But in the meantime, it does make basically all of your spells cost two less. All of your creatures cost two less. Apart from, I suppose, that Simeon Spirit Guide lurking away somewhere in the list. So Eric down to just five life off that attack and needing something pretty big off the top of his deck here. I got a chance to speak to Shuhai Nakamura about this deck between rounds earlier on. And he's not necessarily one to blow his own trumpet about decks or sort of act super confident, but he was like, I think I like my deck. I think my <laughs> deck's quite good. And Seeing it in action, I kind of have to agree. Yeah, it's been looking quite good so far this round. We'll just take an extra turn or so here. It looks like things kicking off uh, uh, Nakamura and Mahara on the front table, but thus far no permanence in play. We'll see whether or not Luis can put this one away for us in the next turn or so before we jump back. Remember on one of the blockers that Eric Froelich has going on here, killing off Scavenging Ooze, potentially decisive here. There may not be time for that Gavany Challenge chip to prove relevant. All that Eric could do there was eat some creatures in the graveyard with the scavenging ooze before it got uh, killed off by Dismember. Not because he wanted to make his uh, creature bigger, but simply because he wanted to gain a couple of points of life, because this is a big set of swings coming in here. But it looks like Luis has got it anyway, and we'll get a chance to jump right back to our table A match, at Shuhai Nakamura against Makahito Mahara. Um, more Eldrazi, more of the time. I'm perfectly fine with this. A fitting start to Oath of the Gatewatch being in constructed. And here's another Molten Rain on Eldrazi Temple. Just such a powerful play. But this time there is a Reality Smasher already around. And that kind of putting the brakes on for Mahara when it comes to attacking. Kind of not a great sign for Mahara when he sees the 5-5 five five coming in. We get a chance to see the interaction between Urborg and uh, Ayavugin here. Oh, wow. Double Simeon Spirit Guides. That's a 7-7 seven, seven endless one. Yeah, the, the first time that I encountered Ayavugin letting you cast Endless One in a huge way was definitely not a happy time for me because, sadly, it was not me being clever doing deck building. It was someone else <laughs> being clever doing one of my matches on Magic Online. And the interaction between Urborg and Ayavugin, just something that has made many of these Eldrazi decks that much more powerful. When your land makes your Eldrazi cost less and taps for mana, it's just great. There we see the Expedition version. Originally printed in World Wake, that version, though, straight out of Oath of the Gatewatch. Nakamura 
Kimura there fetching a waste off the path to exile. And on just two life here. I mean, the perfect thing to do here would simply be to cast a reality smasher and smash. The fact that it's not already happened suggests to me that there's going to have to be something cleverer here from Shuhei Nakamura. Because he knows that if he untaps, there's a very, very good chance that this burn deck will be able to find a way of dealing with those last two points. Shuhei Nakamura, one of the most experienced players at this Pro Tour, or indeed any Pro Tour. He has more Planeswalker points than just about anybody on the planet, and indeed more than quite a lot of people on the planet put together. He has been playing a crazy amount of matches of Magic for a very, very long time indeed. But in a rough spot here against Makahito Mahara's burn deck. little smile on Mahara's face there. I think that he knows as well as anyone that the longer that Shuhei Nakamura thinks here, the better it is for him in some respects because it means that there's not an easy answer. Is there a burn spell here from Mahara? Well, there's a lightning bolt. That enough for Shuhei Nakamura to scoop them up. Makahito Mahara wins two games to one. We're going to get a chance to see whether or not in our other decider match on the back table, we get to see if El Jazi can do a little better. Luis Scott Vargas, he's picked up one loss so far this tournament, and he's up against his friend Eric Froelich. The game just started. And El Jazi mimic the first play from uh, Luis Scott Vargas. And there's Birds of Paradise, original beta Birds of Paradise from Eric Froelich. And Thought Not Seer getting to take the best card right out of Eric Froelich's hand. And it takes it for good because. This is an exile ability. Kind of an embarrassment of riches there. Two copies of Path to Exile, a Corsair of Crufix, Court of Calling, and Restoration Angel. Taking the first removal spell. Just great stats there we see on the side of the screen for Luis Scott Vargas. A member of the Hall of Fame and playing a huge amount of Pro Tours, top eighting five of them. He's won one of them, um, and soon to be a father. Gut shot to deal with um, Birds of Paradise. That kind of an interesting addition. Three of them in the sideboard for this um, Eldrazi deck that's come out of the original Channel Fireball team. So the player's shortcutting a little bit here, end of the turn. This looks like uh, Ifro fetching for Sacred Foundry untapped uh, into Path to Exile on the Thought Not Seer, and Luis responds with Gut Shot on Ifro's uh, Birds of Paradise. The problem being faced by Eric Froelich here, he did not play a land that turn. The best that he could do is a relatively unscary uh, copy of Voice of Resurgence, as, a, as compared to a very scary, indeed, endless one that has pumped an Eldrazi Mimic up to 7-7. Seven, seven. And now just a 1-1 elemental token to go alongside the lands for Eric Froelich. He finds an overgrown tomb, happily pays the two life, and casts Course of Crufix. Is there another land on top? Yes, there is. Yeah, this is a tricky spot for Efro. That gut shot was really important because Efro does have uh, Restoration Angel and Court of Calling. If he had time and mana to assemble those things, he'd be able to, to get the Kiki-Jiki combo going. But note, does not have enough time in the face of that gut shot and dismember disruption. Well, we've got another result for you. Ryochi Tamada remains king of the hill. He defeats Alex Bianchi's Jeskai control deck. We will see more of him in the feature match area. Just the two matches, or just the one match left here, in fact, because it looks like uh, Luis Scott Vargas able to put things away. Now we just have Darwin Castle with his affinity deck up against John Finkel on Infect. So Finkel has one piece of the puzzle. He's got Infect creatures in play. Glistener Elf the more straightforward 1-1-for-1 one, one one with Infect, then Ink Moth Nexus also. Does he have the pump spells? We'll find out soon enough. For Darwin Castle, it's more sort of out there on the board. He's got his 
collection of artifacts. And with two copies of Signal Pest, he's able to attack in and be very difficult to block here. Darwin on 24 life, but life not the important bit against an Infect deck. He's already taken three points of poison. Gradually, Arkban Ravager, Ravager growing there. Protection, Protection from artifacts, thanks to an Apostle's Blessing, means that there's going to be no blocking for Darwin Castle here. The big question is, how much pump does John Finkel have? He's on nine life. He can't afford to take too much damage here. But potentially, well, there's plus four plus four from uh, a Might of Old Crosa. I have no cards in hand, so as far as I know, there's no way I can possibly okay, block. Right, so not blocking. Yeah, yeah, that's plus six, plus six, Darwin. I'm afraid to say that even if you hadn't taken poison earlier on in the game, that a colossal swing there from John Finkel that forces a game three here. This our last match in the feature match area. Let's talk a little bit about this matchup because it's one that we're likely to see a fair amount this weekend. Both of these decks, some of the more popular ones. Um, in principle, there can be infect coming from both sides. Both of these both these games we've seen thus far can come down to poison. Um, mm -hmm. The difference being that the affinity deck can just simply have an explosive draw and beat down more traditionally. But some of the powerful cards in uh, affinity, the likes of um, Vault Scourge to gain life, not quite so relevant here. Yeah, absolutely. As the players are just shuffling up here and doing their sideboarding, we are going to get a chance to see exactly what's going down on the floor here. We've got our camera roving in the sky, showing you exactly what's going on. And we'll, we'll get a chance to see quite how many matches still out there. This a kind of quick format, um, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't get deadlock. We can see quite a few players still doing the do here in round five. This is the first round where you can actually really be out of the Pro Tour. Mm -hmm. A 4 4 record will get you into day two. So, in some respects, some of these players will be playing for their tournament life. I mean, it looks like we've got uh, a number of top players. It looks like we c I can see we have Tomohara Saito. He's still playing his match there. Unsurprised to see Fla Frank Carsten still playing. A little bit of a methodical player, but does love his affinity. And this is a tournament where affinity very, very powerful. And somewhere back behind all of that is our little whisper cube where myself, Tim Willoughby, and Ian Duke <laughs> are doing a thing. We are waving, honest we are. You can't see us. In fact, all you can see is this is Pro Tour Oath the Gate Watch, and we're heading back to very shortly be able to see that man, John Finkel, Hall of Famer, against that man, Darwin Castle, Hall of Famer, playing a little bit more magic. Darwin Castle's a player that actually I would potentially have thought might have brought something really unusual. I would say that he has one of the biggest ranges of decks that he might play in a tournament of almost anyone in the room. John Finkel, he's kind of portrayed himself thus far in modern Pro Tours to be very keen on something very aggressive and ideally non-interactive almost. We've seen him play Infect a couple of times. We've seen him play Storm a couple of times. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think John does tend to favor those decks. Um, that said, you know, he is a part of, of Team Pantheon. They do a lot of testing together. And actually, John made a, a comment last night at dinner that, that really um, resonated with me. He said, you know, I'm, with, I'm here with a lot of smart people, and chances are that a lot of smart people thinking together are going to come up with a smarter idea than I can alone. So he tends to go with what the team comes up with, and I think that's a really wise choice in this case. So we get a chance to see the opening hand here from Castle. There's not any lands in there, but actually that not automatically a massive problem for him because with the likes of Mox Opal, maybe an Ornithopter going on, he may have some mana there, but definitely a tough decision for Castle as Finkel looks at a hand that's a little bit more straightforwardly lands and spells. Memnite, Memnite, Mox Opal. Who needs lands? He has Metalcraft. He's able to tap for mana. He can even Galvanic Blast on the first turn if he wanted, but Signal Pest seems like a safer choice. No land, no problem. Yours. John Finkel will struggle to have a start quite as explosive as that, but he doesn't need nearly as many permanents in, able to, in order to get his game going here. Windswept Heath 
finding a green source. I would guess most likely a breeding pool here. Um, no, just a straightforward forest and casting a Glistener Elf. I think I did glimpse uh, Rancor in John Finkel's hand, which will be able to force through damage even in spite of some potential blockers on Darwin Castle's side of the table. Yeah, the real question this game is going to be how does Darwin use his Galvanic Blast? Um, is he going to hold it up you know, indefinitely throughout the game and just try to get in for four damage at a time? Is he going to try to get a couple more threats on the table first? Um, and in turn, you know, how is John going to move in on this Glistener Elf? Is he just going to very quickly try to go for a quick kill or is he going to play it a little bit more slowly and try to um, you know, keep up tricks to defend the Glistener Elf? You don't normally see that many pump spells in Constructed Magic. Uh, this certainly one of the few decks that runs a whole host of them. Uh, and that really changes the timing on when you might use a removal spell, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the tricky things with this Infect deck is it needs just sort of the perfect mix of creatures and pump spells uh, in order to assemble a combo kill. Uh, sometimes the Infect deck only draws one creature, and if you just kill it right away when the shields are down and they can't play a pump spell, you can get away with a free win. Um, but, of course, that's always a gamble if uh, if the Infect deck is able to follow up with another creature and they haven't expended any pump spells in the first one, then you run the risk of you know wasting your removal spell, um, not getting the maximum efficiency out of it. So we saw there Springleaf Drum followed up by Vault Scourge from Darwin Castle. Uh, the 1-1 one, one Flying Lifelink. The Lifelink not so relevant as the Flying potentially here, uh, able to block even an Ink Moth Nexus. I could spy uh, Become Immense in John Finkel's hand, so he'll be looking to get cards in the graveyard, and one great way of doing that is, of course, these fetch lands. Rancor, yep. Rancor giving Trample to his 1-1 one, one Glistener Elf, along with plus two power. The fact that John Finkel is attacking in here in spite of the Vault Scourge suggests to me that he likely either has a pump spell he often will have a pump spell in this deck, or that he has another creature that he's going to be able to play. Uh, the Rancor comes back even if that creature dies, so it's not going to hurt. And we actually see that he has both of those options. Nice to have options. Gets in his first points of poison on Darwin Castle here. Yeah, not a huge amount of value in blocking there since the Rancor does grant trample. And as you said, Tim, it's almost uh, for certain that John has either a pump spell or a follow-up creature. I mean, essentially, pump spells and creatures is his deck. Aside from the lands that he needs to get everything going. Um, but with a Spellskite and a Galvanic Blast, there is a fair amount of disruption potentially here from Darwin Castle. Spellskite, very good against the Poison decks. Yeah, absolutely. Spellskite is going to be huge. I imagine we'll see that this turn from Darwin. Darwin, who it should be noted, has not yet drawn a land in this game. The fact that the Phyrexian mana cost to redirect things on Spellskite is simply damaging life rather than dealing with any infect means that Darwin Castle can afford to redirect an awful lot of things with it if he so chooses. As it is, though, it looks like Darwin might just be happy to flood the board a bit. He starts off with a Springleaf Drum. If he draws the likes of a Master of Ethereum or similar, it will have a big impact on this board. I'd really like to see Darwin get that spell skite onto the battlefield this turn. Right. I think he's considering maybe just leaving up the Gal Galvanic Blast, but that is potentially pretty dangerous. Could be a combination of pump spells or, um, you know, some kind of blue disruption, like a spell pierce or something like that. Means that Galvanic Blast would not be a totally safe bet just by itself. And yeah, it does look like Darwin takes the slightly more conservative route and gets the spell skite in play, which I, I definitely agree with. Happy to take a point to fetch a land, get a card in the graveyard, which might make become immense better. And no pain from that breeding pool as he's just going to put it into play tapped at the end of turn. Finkel comes a rumbling. Now, I guess the good thing about uh, 
infect on top of everything else. Under normal circumstances, you attack your 3 1 into your opponent 0 4, and they just bounce. Because of infect, though, you are going to get to put a whole bunch of counters on there. So there's, we see 3 minus 1 minus 1 counters on Spellskite. It now a minus 3 1 creature. Now, the minus 3 functionally the same as 0. But the ability is still very relevant. And two cards drawn here for thought size for Darwin Castle. Dot cast, rather. Sorry, yes. Yeah, this is a, a really tough spot for John here. That uh, spell skite came down at just the right time. It looks like John's got um, access to some pump spells in his hand, but uh, he can't really take any action there until the spell skite is off the off the table. And that's going to be. It's looking like a minimum of, of two more turns for John before he can really deploy the um, pump spells in his hand. And of course, we know Darwin also sitting on a Galvanic Blast. So this is going to be a really tough maze of answers for John to navigate through. Uh, that said, I mean, Darwin has a good amount of pressure, but it's not like right. super life-threatening here. So, you know, John probably has about two turns to piece something together, ideally. So an attack for four here on the face of things from uh, Castle. Okay. Ink Moth Nexus steps up. The creature land looking to block completely safely on Signal Pest. And then a spare Glistener Elf effectively jumping in the way of a Memnite. Yeah, great blocks here by John. I mean, this takes away a lot of uh, Darwin's pressure. And we see Darwin fiddling with the Glimmer Void. I wonder if he's considering using a Galvanic Blast. And he does. Yeah, keeping around Signal Pest represents potentially quite a bit of damage. There are more creatures set on the battlefield there. One of the Memnites did not come in, instead choosing to sit on its drum. Now that a great draw for John Finkel in the face of a Spellskite. It looked like he's going to be able to do something pretty nifty here in terms of switching power and toughness. Uh, are you at 11 now? Yeah. There's exactly one copy of Twisted Image in John Finkel's sideboard. Clearly coming in in this matchup where spell sky a problem and switching the power and toughness of a creature with zero or in this case less power and drawing a card, absolutely fantastic use of mana. So before anything else, John Finkel looking to get rid of that spell sky because it will open the door to a big become immense here. And the response, a Galvanic Blast. I like this timing a lot for Darwin Castle here. Yeah, so this is in the middle of combat. The uh, rankered Glistener Elf is blocked by Memnite. John Finkel twisted images the spell Skype in response. Darwin Castle is using Galvanic Blast. And what this does is, if John was planning to respond to Galvanic Blast with some pump spells, the spell Skype is still on the battlefield at this time. So Darwin Castle could redirect him to the spell Skype, which would not only soak them up, but also potentially keep it alive through the, the twisted image. So really, really nice sequence there by Castle. As it is, a Noble Hierarch at the follow-up. That Rancor going back to John Finkel's hand when the Glistener Elf died, so we see it come right back down again. Yeah, unfortunately on a Noble Hierarch this time, so a lot less threatening since it's not dealing uh, infect damage. Yeah, an awful lot of work to do if uh, John Finkel planning on winning this game with more traditional sources of damage, because Darwin Castle's still on 22 life. big attacks here coming from Darwin Castle. We see that now he's not really too worried about holding back with his creatures. When the only one is threatening regular damage, it's not nearly as scary, even with their 
a handful of pump spells potentially from Finkel. Single-digit life total now for Finkel. He's got to be a little concerned. And another Vault Scourge, meaning that Darwin Castle's life total likely to be going up rather than down. The Infect plan, it was always plan A, but plan B looking pretty terrible now for John Finkel. John Finkel and Darwin Castle. They were classmates in the very first Hall of Fame. Finkel been a little bit more active in the last few years, though. But John's not out of this game yet. I mean, Darwin has four points of damage a turn so far. John's at nine. So if he does top deck uh, Infect Creature next turn, with the combination of pump spells in his hand, he could actually be in, in great shape here. This, the Dismember sat in Finkel's hand. Not necessarily something he's going to be able to cast because his life total in a pretty precarious state here on five. Apostle's Good. Blessing likely to be more important if he wants to sneak through damage. Yeah, looks like looks like John did not hit a creature that turn. Yeah, instead, just picking up uh, another support spell in the form of Apostle's Blessing. So I believe it's going to be too late for him at this point uh, with Steel Overseer coming down. And there's another dismember drawn, and that the handshake from John Finkel. Darwin Castle wins two games to one. That meaning that Finkel now on three and two. Darwin Castle, though, four and one, a nice spot to be in at this stage in the tournament. And that the end of our match in the feature match area. Lots of action from various different Eldrazi lists. Either of them your particular favorite at this point? I like the, the Channel Fireball list a lot. I think the inclusion of Main Deck Chalice the Void is just really, really well positioned for the tournament. Awesome inclusion there. Yeah, I mean, we certainly saw just in the very first game of our feature match area this round, when you cast a turn one Chalice of the Void, yeah. I mean, at that point, we don't know if Shuhai Nakamura realized that Burn was the thing that he was playing against, but stopping one drops always Yeah, a almost place against to do. any deck on the play. It's just a great spot to be in. But at the end of our round from the feature match area, I'm going to be heading back down to the feature match area to see things live from the next few rounds. But stay tuned, because from the news desk, we've got all the action for here from round five, and obviously plenty more action for future rounds here at Pro Tour at the Gatewatch. Thanks very much to Tim and Ian. Now, the way that Swiss pairings work, where you always play against someone on the same record as yourself, more or less, uh, just apart from the odd buys or draws or whatever it turns out to be, but mostly everyone's on the same record, you start with 400 players, you get 200 players at 1-0, 100 at 2-0, 50, 24, 25, a dozen or so players get to 5 and 0. Oh. Some of the players who have made it to that perfect start 5 and 0 oh, include uh, Suripong Popitagul of Thailand. He defeated Fabrizio Anteri. Almost no one's been able to do that recently. Uh, Anteri falls to 4 and 1. Martin Muller of Denmark is 5 and 0. Oh. So is the Brazilian Thiago Saparito at uh, the Platinum Pro. Matt Nass fell to him in this round 5. Ryuichi Tamada are on track for another Pro Tour top 8 early. Still a long way to go, of course. 11 rounds still to come. Matej Zatelkai, he got to 5 and 0 oh at the expense of the player of the year, Mike Sigrist. Sigrist has his first defeat for one. Zatelkai 5 0. Oh. In the Japan battle, we saw Makahita Mahara, the 2006 world champion, take out the two. 2008 player of the year Shuhei Nakamura both in the Hall of Fame of course and someone else in the Hall of Fame is Frank Carsten he'll be along in just a few minutes to talk to us about his yes that's right it's a shock I know affinity deck uh, meanwhile uh, Paul Cheon and Louis Scott Vargas are on collision course possibly for a round six clash they're both four and one and just hearing that Jason Chung the New Zealand Platinum Pro has advanced to five and oh over Carl Bogomis, who was the finalist uh, behind Simon Gertsen in 2010. All right, so and that's what's going on uh, here, but with around about a minute left in the round, um, BDM is out on the floor, and I imagine there are still a fair few matches going. So, Brian David Marshall, what's happening out on the floor? All right, Brian David Marshall here with reigning world champion Seth Manfield. Seth, how's your tournament going? Um, pretty good. I'm 3-2 right now. I've got one loss in each um, 
constructed and modern, but I feel pretty good. I feel like I was a little unlucky to lose the rounds I lost, drafted pretty well, and I like my deck um, moving forward in, in in modern. So, so, so uh, modern, that, that's where your first Pro Tour Top 8 came, right? Yeah, I've, I've traditionally done well in modern events, and I, I uh, feel like I know the format well, and the deck I'm playing has some, some, some new twi a new twist to it, but I'm still playing aggressive creatures and and burn and just trying to, you know, get get as get 20 damage in as soon turn three turn four. Um, that's kind of what I'm known for almost. And our team name is Team Blitz, so that's basically my style. So. So, so tell me a little bit about Team Blitz. How, how was it preparing with a somewhat new team for you for this Pro Tour? Yeah, I mean the team's kind of evolved a little bit. It's been nice. Um, it's got. There's a, a large contingent of the team lives in Roanoke near Star City, and then you've got me, and you've got the Outliers. You got my friend Chris Fennell, who's uh, currently got one loss in the tournament, and it was good. We all sort of gel together. We've got our limited guys, we've got our constructed guys, we've got our niche archetype guys, and we've got other players we can draw on. You know, we've got like Tom Ross, who lives in Roanoke. We can say, hey, we want the best infect list, and you know, some of us have have taken that advice to heart. So. All right, awesome. You got you got a little bit of work to do, but you're in okay shape heading into the last round here at Pro Tour Oath of the Gate Watch. So that was Seth Manfield came in yesterday to talk to us, and now that's the state of play uh, for him. More results coming in. Let's talk about some four and ones because you know, so like I say, only a dozen players or so have that perfect 5-0 record. So amongst the four and ones, uh, Gabriel Fair is doing very nicely. A former Brazilian team member, he was part of the Nice World Magic Cup squad. He's four one. That means Robin Dola of Slovenia is at uh, three and two. Uh, more results coming in here for you. Um, Bartlemy Lewandowski. Of Poland, he's 5 0. He's defeated Nathan Holiday. Um, you remember Lewandowski was in feature match action last round against Alexandra Cesar uh, from Argentina. Uh, 12 matches left by our reckoning. One of those has a Brian David Marshall standing by them. BDM, what you got for us? Hey, Rich, I'm watching a match. You can see a big crowd gathered here along the rail watching Hall of Famer Ben Stark as he plays against Rodrigo Conclaves de Santos, who uh, I believe is coming off a pretty good weekend in Grand Prix Mexico City. And uh, the two players, Ben Stark seems to be playing a four-color aggro deck. Uh, Santos is playing a more traditional Naya burn deck. They're in game three. They have a couple of extra minutes uh, with a judge standing by, he has it there. He's got the five extra turns all laid out, ready to go. Uh, they're coming up on time. No, it looks like we've got a match win. Hold on. What I say is true. Ben Stark has won the match. So that just happened. Ben Stark won, managed to do it before they ran out of time. That's what's happening here on the floor. Right, great stuff, BDM. Thanks so much. Uh, great to just get you as close as we can to the action. Skycam hard at work there for you. Uh, so a couple of others at 4-1. Josh Atalayton from Team Channel Fireball has only one defeat. He defeated Japan's Takashi Kawaguchi that round. Uh, and also Frank Lepore, um, once a, a TCG player, he's now at 4-1 uh, over China's Huao Chao Song. So, uh, Song at three and two, Lepore four and one. That's a tremendous start to his first Pro Tour. Melissa de Tora, his other half, definitely rooting uh, for Frank in this one. I know a lot of you are too. We hear a lot about uh, how popular Frank is around the Magic community. All right, so it's deck tech time once again. We thought, who can we, who can we possibly find to talk to us about Affinity? Well, it is one of the most popular decks and a man who we pretty much knew was gonna play it from the Hall of Fame, 5-0, here comes Frank Carsten.